Hey, everybody. Welcome to the Art of Transformation podcast. I'm your host, Mark Schaff. Today's guest is Constantine Morun. He has his own podcast called Unleash Thyself. I was on it, and you can check out the episode. There's going to be a link below. He is, we had a really amazing conversation, which you're about to listen to. The, the one thing that really stood out to me is he's a neuroencoding transformational growth specialist. What does that mean? It's a lot of words. But what's really interesting is he breaks it down. He breaks it down and shows you how you can use language and use some of the practices that he uses and that I use in my coaching to create a foundation for growth and why that's important because it's, you know, how is that practical? How can you actually put that to use in your life? I'm excited for the episode. I had a great time talking to Constantine. Have a listen and I'll see you on the other side. Hey everybody, welcome back to the Art of Transformation. I am here. I'm very, very excited to have my guest, Constantine Moran, who um, I actually met him because I wanted to be on his podcast. So you can go listen to his podcast. I'll, I'll definitely have a link to our episode in, in this episode for his wonderful podcast called Unleash Thyself. Uh, Constantine, thank you so much for, for being here today. Mark, such a pleasure. We had such a beautiful conversation on my show and those listening right now, you can go check it out. Mark has some fire advice to share and also <laughs> his story is simply amazing. I've learned a lot myself. I felt inspired after that. So yeah, go check it out if you want some inspiration. So, um, you know, Constantine, you submitted your information for the podcast and I was actually curious because we didn't talk about this on your podcast that you're a licensed neuroencoding uh, specialist. Tell me about what yes. that is. I, I love that question. So it's something I stumbled upon last year, early last year, and it's neuroencoding is essentially a certification that someone by the name of uh, Joseph McLennan III came up with. And he's a neuroscientist, a, a doctor in psychology, and he's been helping high achievers, top performers to be at the top of their game over mm. the years, right? So he's been studying not just psychology, but also NLP and hypnotherapy and other methodologies. And he combined them into his method called neuroencoding, and then he started certifying uh, people. And when I started looking at his stuff, I was like, man, this this is weird because he has different tools and exercises that seem like they're just fluff. That, you know, like for example, there's an exercise where you look in the mirror and you just say, hey, I love you, Constantine. And you put a big smile on your face. And I thought it was the silliest thing ever until I tried it. And I saw what it brought to my life. And now I use it with all my clients because it's such a good way to ground yourself and bring some happiness into your life and connect yourself to yourself so much more. So in other words, neuroencoding here just essentially is the study of the language of our nervous system and subconscious mm. mind. And how can we get to look at our thoughts and beliefs, see what's what, is it something I want to keep or not? And if it's not, then how do we interrupt them and rewire our brains mm -hmm. for success? And I've been able to apply that to my life because when I first stumbled upon this, for me, it was all about how can I use this to improve my life? And when mm -hmm. I saw that it works really well, I'm like, oh, how can I use this to help others? And that's why I was like, all in. I said, I know I'm going to get a certification, went through the, the courses, through the mentorship. And I'm like, wow, this is this this actually really, really, really works. And the, my mentor always talks about this is about getting further faster. It's not about jumping steps. It's not about um, having a a trick to you know make a million dollars overnight, but it does work fast. Meaning that in my case, it took weeks to see less than weeks, actually, maybe days, even in some cases to see massive progress in the way I think, mm. the thought I entertain, the beliefs I hold, gave me tools to start challenging my own beliefs, interrupt patterns, rewire my brain and so on. Yeah. And I'm curious too, because, you know, this gets a little bit into what I call kind of like woo woo stuff, right? Like, okay, yeah. so, so you're, so you're rewiring your beliefs and, you know, I, something that I, uh, talk a lot about with, you know, with my clients and my groups is that really, you know, what, what a belief is, is just a story that we're telling ourselves over and over right. again. And so whether it's a limiting belief or a religious belief or whatever kind of belief, you know, we can, we can tell ourselves the stories that we need to hear to achieve, you know, to achieve our dreams. So if someone were to, you know, to work with you to go through this work, what are the kinds of results that that you've seen people get once they do this kind of rewiring? Because, you know, like, what's the value? What's the practical application? What, you know, what, what then happens once they've done that? Oh, I love the question so much. There's a lot of different benefits coming out of this. The big ones I would say is that someone going through this process and working with me would be about achieving more, stressing less and creating time for what they love without mm. sacrifice. So not mm. sacrificing your success, your relationship or health. Because most of the time people look at, let's say, personal development or professional development or any type of improvement in their areas as, well, they have to sacrifice something. They have to give something up and they're already busy. They don't want to be doing that. But what I've come to realize in my life, because I'm someone that's considered the high achiever, top performer, 
working in the corporate world, being an entrepreneurial world, is that I was successful despite, let's call them my limitations and my weaknesses. Mm -hmm. But once I started looking at those limitations and those weaknesses and started eliminating them, well, then the sky became the, the new limit. Because all of a sudden it opened up so many doors that I didn't know they were there. So for someone listening to this and being like, what's the benefit of investing in yourself? Well, the benefit is that you get to create the life you've always wanted, not by anyone else's definition, but by your own definition. And most of us, what I have found, and this is, this goes back to me as well, is that I had a definition of success and a definition of my dreams and my vision based on someone else's reality or combination of my parents my caretakers, my teacher, my society, and you name it. Mm -hmm. When you work with me, and I'm sure with you as well, Mark, it's about getting clear on who you are below the indoctrination, below all those stories that are not even yours. So the question then comes down to me, and this is a question I ask myself all the time when a story comes up, let's say a thought or a belief. If you know a thought gets repeated enough times, it becomes a belief. Mm -hmm. So it's a, it's a bigger story. Is that, is it my story or is it someone else's story? And if it's someone else's story, it doesn't mean it's bad necessarily. But then I get to ask the next question is like, do I like this story? Do I mm -hmm. want this to be my story? And then you take it and you apply it to your life and then you maybe make some changes and make it your own story. And this is the power of what I would say, starting with the foundation, your psychology, your thoughts and beliefs about self, others and the world the power of writing your own stories, which means you get to create your own dreams, your own vision, your own life, really, without anyone else's definition of success. Yeah, this was something that I, I've actually dealt with this week. Uh, I was, I was, you know, offered an opportunity to join this very exclusive program, and you know, it's it's expensive and it's time consuming. And the, you know, sort of the thing that they promised, the result, what you know, was very, very appealing. You know, this this yes. sort of massive success and money and all these other things. And um, I'm very proud of myself. I told them I'm not going to give you an answer today. I need to go talk to my team. I need to go think about these things. Does it really work for me? And what I got clear on is, yes, you know, I would love to have those results, but the way that I want to do it, you know, who I am, the way that I want to do it is is different. You know, yeah. there's there's values that I have and there's ways that I want to grow my, you know, my team, my business. And I want to, you know, I want to have those results. And I want to say that I did it in this way that's completely aligned with who I am. Because I think it's very, you know, it's very seductive to to listen to society, to listen to, you know, all these, you know, all these sort of success gurus out there saying, you just got to you just got to push these levers and say these things and you know and then you get all the all the stuff but how to do that in a really authentic way i think this kind of work that you're doing is so important because how do you discover that without i mean in your case literally looking in the mirror right exactly and for me like if you look at this has been my challenge to like what you described to a t because i've been someone that's been climbing the corporate ladder i have a really successful career with microsoft as part of their enterprise sales team so you could say i'm at the top of my game right from here i could stay in this career for the rest of my life and have enough money and success to to have a comfortable life or i could climb the ladder going on to leadership and whatnot whatever right those are options but then i realized i'm like is it fully aligned with who i am and i was able to bring my why my gifts and strengths into my work ever since i've done the discovery and the clarity around it and it made me a better core mm. so that's why i'm still there because it, I, i'm able to bring it in but then a part of me is like well i can do more too why mm. if i actually share some of this stuff with other people and start coaching them and mentoring them. And that's how I started down this path that you are on too. And you found yourself, it's like, it wasn't necessarily because it was like, oh, I really want to be a coach because I've been a coach most of my life. It's more like, wait a second, I don't want to hold this information back because if it's helped my life and the life of all these people I've been able to impact, I'm sure it's going to impact many others. And to me, it's always the foundation. So we talked about the foundation as your thoughts and beliefs about self, others in the world. And then what I do in my programs, for example, the one I developed right now, and it's been a seeing amazing success in my clients is that you, as you build a foundation, you start there, there's likely big fires in your life right now that you can put out and have a ripple effect across your life. Perhaps a challenge in your relationship or perhaps a challenge in your emotions and how you handle them and how you don't handle them, right? And then as you start to build a foundation, it's about getting clear on your why, on your mm -hmm. purpose. On that I was going to ask you about that, actually. I, that was my next, my next right? question. You're but doing here, great. <laughs> do, you, do you remember that book by Simon Sinek that says start of with course. why? Of course. I have the no? start with why. I have the workbook. I've seen the TED Talk yes. a thousand times. Absolutely. Yeah. Right. And that's what I started too. And here's the funny thing, uh, Mark. I started with that. I, I watched, like you said, TED Talk. I watched other videos, other people. It took me months to come up with it. And then it took me another, like I don't know, seven months to actually do something with it. And mm. here's what I found. Because when I look back, I'm like, well, how did I get to this point? My foundation was too weak for it because I had my why, but my thoughts and beliefs were not supporting 
mm. what I was finding. So that's why for me, I reversed that instead of starting with why I'm like, let's start with the foundation. You know, some people, it's not like your foundation is weak. No one necessarily has a weak foundation because if you're here, you're likely a high achiever. You're a top performer. I've already seen success in your life, but some pieces of the foundation are weaker than others and are not necessarily yours which means that you now get to look in and say, well, you know what? Can I replace this wooden board, the beam that holds my foundation with something made out of steel maybe? And now I'm not going to self-sabotage as much. I'm not going to allow self-doubt to creep in. All those beautiful things. Mm. So for me, it's like if you start with a foundation, you know, a few weeks in, you can move into the why. And the why exercise, so like finding that why or getting clear if you have an idea of why it is, also opens the door to find your gifts and strengths. Because most of us know some of the things were greater. But from everyone I've seen in my life and including myself, it's not like we've ever spent time to really dig in and see what are those innate gifts you were born with and seem to come up all the time. Maybe you're a people person, maybe you're an optimist, whatever the case might be. And then also the strengths. What are those abilities you've developed over time that set you apart and mm -hmm. double down of them? Because there's a lot of research that looked at like, okay, who gets more out of life? Those that invest in gifts and strengths, so their abilities, or those that invest in improving their weaknesses. Mm. And I was pleasantly surprised to see that it's like, it's not even close. If you double down on your gifts and strengths, you're going to see a much bigger ROI than if you just look at improving all the areas you think you're lacking in. That's that's really interesting that that you you've got that kind of um, you know that 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 split between sort of improving on strengths or sorry imp yeah improving on strengths and improving weaknesses. I mean, what's it, when 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 you're doing this work, I imagine that you know quote unquote weaknesses come up things like you know self doubt things like the way we hold ourselves back. So how do you you know, when you're when you're working, I know you you work with people one on one, and I I do want you to talk at some point about the events you've got coming up. Mm -hmm. When people come in, I mean, do they just ignore the weaknesses? Like, how does that work? How do they how how does that foundation get built? Because I can say from experience, you know, I've I've been doing this kind of work for a long time. It's not that I never have self doubt. So how does this how 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 do you use that distinction to to help people kind of get past the obstacles, the you know the thing the ways they're getting in their own way? I love the question so much, Mark because here's how I see it. Um, I see it as challenges and weaknesses. So like self-doubt, procrastination, overwhelm, the various fears, fear of failure, fear of success, fear yeah. of rejection, Oh yeah. right? Self-loathing. I don't necessarily see those as weaknesses. I see those as challenges being presented to us. Mm. A weakness for you, I'll give you an example for me. What's a weakness for me? Or was when I started on this? When I started my podcast, a weakness for me was editing my podcast, <laughs> right? Because I, I wasn't good at it. It was like something that I wasn't great at. Yeah, hard same, from... hard same, my friend. <laughs> but here's what I did. Instead of focusing on what I was great at, which was like talking to people, doing the interviews, posting on social media, I doubled down on like, I need to learn this. So now it took me, what, 10 hours, 20 hours a week and editing. So imagine if I had put all the time into improving my ability to mm. present, my ability to host an I interview, see. my ability to coach someone or any of those things. I mean, without even going into details, the ROI would be much bigger. Today, I've delegated my, like you, my editing to someone else that that's their specialty and that's their gift and strength and they can double down on it. It's not mine. Now, when it comes to self-doubt, which is not necessarily a material thing, right? Or any of the fears mentioned, or any of those things, I see them as challenges in the sense that most of us get, get challenged by one or many of those despite our success. And I call them the thieves of our time and dreams. And there's 10 of them, right? So let's see if I remember them all, but there's imposter syndrome, procrastination, overwhelm, self-doubt, self-loathing, stress. And then we have fear of success, fear of failure, fear of rejection. And there's one more I'm missing here. But essentially, if you think about those and anyone listening, how many times in your life have you been afflicted by at least one or more of those? I know that every single one was part of my life at some point, And I would want to say more than half of them were present at any given time, right? So like I joined Microsoft when I was in my early 30s. Imposter syndrome and self-doubt mm -hmm. and self-loathing were huge for me and fear of failure and fear of success because I came from a small startup into this massive company in a very senior role. I was the youngest by like two decades with the rest of my team. And I felt like, wow. How did I make it here? Like, you know, that imposter thing that comes up and then self-doubt creeps in and then maybe some hesitation. Oh, hesitation was number 10 there that we missed. <laughs> right? Hesitation came up, procrastination, overwhelm, right? And you can start to relate and be like, oh yeah, that comes up. But yet you're successful, which means that if you start to overcome some of these challenges, 
not that they disappear, but you have the tools to overcome them before they're on their course, before they derail you, before they sabotage you, then all of a sudden the sky is the limit and you can do anything and everything you want. It doesn't matter what it is that you want. Yeah. I'm curious to ask too, because you know, you talk about the the work that you do. Is there is there a common, you know, set of traits or a common like a kind of person who's kind of just in the right place or maybe a, a kind of place that they're in that makes someone kind of really, really in the perfect place to receive this work? Yeah, I love the question, Mark. And yes, I would say that if we look at the people I've worked with the most and the people that feel attracted the most to me, that are, they, they, they can associate themselves with a high achiever, right? So there's someone that wants more for themselves and their family, but also potentially the world, right? like mm-hmm. making a big impact. So they might be an entrepreneur, they might be an executive, they might be an artist, they might be even an athlete, right? I work with a couple of them. And they usually, these are the things that they realize in their life, that they're too busy to do the things that they love, right? Either spend time with their family, mm-hmm. with their kids, with their partner, or maybe start the business they've always wanted, right? Mm-hmm. Or they're too tired, overwhelmed, stressed, and burnt out. Those are usually the five big pillars I see people that come to me struggle with the most. And if someone is too busy, which is something I used to pride myself in, I'd be like, I'm so busy, which meant mm-hmm. that too busy equal successful. Mm-hmm. <laughs> and we know that that's, you know, that's a lie <laughs> that we like to tell ourselves the society likes to tell us to keep us preoccupied and distracted. Then I realized, well, we, we can take some control back. And if you align yourself with a foundation, if you allow yourself with uh, your why and your gifts and your strengths, all of a sudden you start to create time out of thin air because people kept asking me over my last three years of transformation. It's like, constantly, how do you have time for a full-time job and coaching and a podcast and all these things? And I didn't know initially. And I was like, well, I just love what I do. <laughs> and in part, that's true. Yeah, it's funny. You're reminding me of a conversation I had. You know, I was I was exploring, you know, early on kind of who, who I wanted to work with and what their challenges were. So I, I have a friend who was a, in leadership position at a, you know, mm-hmm. at a, very well-known kind of branding product design company. And I just said, you know, kind of like, what's the, what's the challenge for you? And, and, you know, there's so much there around time and balance and, you know, being, being present. Nobody, nobody on their deathbed says, I wish I worked more. Right. So, so, I, but I asked him, I'm like, okay, so what's, you know, sort of what's getting in your way from maybe doing some of the work with a coach or, or someone to, to help you with that? He said, well, I don't, I don't need another project. And that was really fascinating to me. And I'm hearing you say this too, is that yes, you know, obviously you have to put energy into this work, but what you receive on the other hand, you know, the, the ROI, if you will, in terms of time, uh, in terms of balance, you know, in terms of really getting a handle on these, uh, what did you call them? The thieves, you know, time and dreams. Yeah. Yeah, get, getting a handle on these thieves. What's so beautiful about about this work, and it saved, I mean, honestly, it saved me, you know, it saves me 10, 15, 20 hours a week. And I have a client who I, I had this conversation with, you know, she was having a hard time making a very, you know, important set of decisions. And, and you know, we, we, we worked through it for a while, but at some point I was like, how much, how much time have we spent on it? You know, what, what, if, if we look back over the last few weeks, what if we had made this decision sooner? What would you, you know, what, how much time would you have had back? And what would you maybe have done with that? And what dream might we have filled that, that time with? And we're continuing to work together. And now we're in kind of a new place saying, okay, we're going to, com- we're going to commit to this to this dream, to this vision we have for our life, which doesn't, I don't think anybody's vision is I'm, I want to be working all the time. Hopefully not. Unless it's for a good cause. If, I mean, I've seen people that are like, you know what? I love my cause and my wife so much that I can, it's not work anymore. It's just doing what you love. Right. And I love what you said, because many people are like, well, if I'm too busy, how can I now start working with someone like Mark or Constantine to improve that area of my life or any other area? And I love the question whenever it comes up in my conversations, I do, you know, clarity calls and strategy calls with people to see where they are. And if I can help them, if I can't, I pass them on to someone that can, because I Mm -hmm. have a fairly big network and that's, that's a beautiful thing to see. But the question I ask them is like, what's the cost of not doing something like that? Like I have a math degree, Mark, I think you may have known that, but like, I, I love numbers. So when, you know, back in the day, three, four years ago, now someone asked me, what's the cost of not changing? Then all of a sudden I'm like, oh, wow. That's, you know, if you're someone that cares about money a lot and many of us do, it's like, that's millions of dollars down the road. And to to the point that you could be, you know, (laughs) eight, nine figures for some of us. But then the other question that I get to ask, and it's so beautiful, it's like, what would it be worth to you, Mark, if we can create five hours a week? What would that be worth to you? Like, what's your hourly rate? 
Some people I've worked with may say, you know, I say my hourly rate is 2,000 bucks or 5,000 bucks if they're an exec, right? Or entrepreneurs, I've seen people say up to $20,000. So you're telling me that, you know, if I got you five hours back in a week, you can make $10,000 you know, yeah. 10 to $100,000 right. a week, right? Again, it's money. But what about relationships? Because people don't necessarily look at that, right? Like I knew that when I was working my 60 hours at Microsoft and priding myself into it or 65 or 70 hours, my relationships were suffering, not just mm. with my partner, but with my friends and I don't have children, but if I had kids, those would suffer. So what would that be worth? And then I had people, many people actually say it's priceless. There is no, there is no value to it. So then the next question comes, so would you not take 15 to 30 minutes a day on average to gain back five plus hours every week? And that's on the low end, right? Cause you mentioned, you know, 10, 20 hours, like with the type of stuff I'm doing, like I personally, I created in my life easily 40 hours a week. Yeah, it's really, I mean, God, I remember. I remember when I really, really started looking at this problem, kind of in the way that you're you're talking about, but creating creating that time for myself. And it sounds like some sort of magical thing, and and you and I know that it's it's really not. But creating that time for myself, um, you know, one of the things that I have my clients do. You're familiar with this concept, I'm sure, is really kind of doing like an energy audit. Like, okay, so where are you spending your yeah. time? What you know, what are you what are you putting in? What are you getting back? Maybe it's in terms of money. Maybe it's just in terms of you know a feeling. And you start to re you start to you can see very clearly once you sort of chart it out a little bit you know that there's these things that are really important to you whether it's your family kids friendships that you're like well these things are suffering and my vision for myself for who i am is not someone who you know who lets his friendship suffer who lets his relationship suffer it's it's one of these things that that i think that you know that, that our society is so focused on the sort of you know 10xing everything and money and all this other stuff and it's you know it's important we gotta we gotta go do these things and you know i, th I think one of the common well let me ask you actually what 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 is like the you know for the clients that you have what's what's one or two things that they say are the most important to them that that are outside of you know traditional like money Money or that kind of thing. relationships comes pretty much a number one some are don't have a relationship with a significant other so they want to find someone mm -hmm. but then they're too busy to actually find someone of course, yeah. date, right or improving the relationship with their kids with their family with their friends and i would say that those are the big ones now if you think about you mentioned something really cool earlier and i want to bring this up because Whenever I talk about this, it's always such an aha moment for many people, including myself. There's a person by the name of Bronnie Ware. You may be familiar with her. She essentially wrote a book uh, about a decade ago now, The Top Five Regrets of the Dying. Mm, because yeah, she was a nurse, yeah. right? They spent time with people that were about to pass away and she chronicled everything that they said and what they were regretting. And you know what came in at number one is the courage to live true to themselves. So many wish they had the courage to live a life true to themselves, not the life others expected of them. Now, mm -hmm. most people don't think about this. Like you ask me the question, this would not be number one on the list because don't some, most people don't think. Now, there are some clients I've worked with that would be like, you know what? I want more clarity on this because it feels like I'm living someone else's dream. But most yeah. of us are, I wouldn't say so asleep because they may sound judgmental because I consider myself as someone that was asleep for a long time. But that's kind of how it feels. Like I didn't even realize I was living someone else's dream until I started looking into it. But number two was, what you said is working less. <laughs> the regret was about missing out on life's important moments because of too much time spent on work. And number three is expressing feelings. People wanted to be able to express more feelings freely if they could go back in time. But number four is the one you touched upon and the one I see a lot is staying in touch with friends and family, right? There was a common regret of not maintaining friendships over, over the years. And if you think about friendships, at least in my life, they do require effort from both sides. Now it could be effortless, but it still requires you to invest time and something else in it. So it's a, you know, you both give and receive in the relationship, whatever type of relationship it is, right? And the last point, number five, because this kind of closes up the circle. And this is something that people come to me with like, you know, I'm not happy in my life. I'm not fulfilled. I'm not joyful. Mm -hmm. Number five was many realized too late that happiness is a choice. I regret I not having lived yeah. a happier life. How is it? How is that a, well, I mean, I, <laughs> I think I understand <laughs> this, but I'm going to ask you, how, yes, how is it, give me an example where, you know, maybe, yeah, and, and you can be obviously, you know, keep keep people anonymous, but like where maybe somebody was unhappy and it was really it was really just a matter of choice. Yes, I love that. I mean, first of all, I preface with I believe that everything is a matter of choice in our life. Even mm -hmm. when it feels like we don't have a choice, we do. And I'll take the most basic example and then I'll answer the, the other part yeah. of the question. You know how they say the only two sure things in life are death and taxes? Yeah. Well, let's break down the taxes piece because the death that we can get controversial there. But let's break down taxes. Is it really mandatory or is it a 
a choice. Now, if I don't pay taxes, there are outcomes that are going to happen that are not going to be favorable, but I have a choice. I could choose to not pay taxes, but better yet, I could choose to move to another place in the world where I don't have to pay taxes. Now, I'm in Canada. I pay way too many taxes, right? But that's, <laughs> that's the reality of me making a choice to live in this country. I came from Europe, from Eastern I could go back to some countries in Europe, like, for example, Germany and Portugal. You could be, a, let's say... Um, crypto investor and don't have to pay anything on your crypto uh, currency gains or anything, right? So there are other countries, right, in certain parts of the world where you pay no tax if you wanted to, right? So even that's a choice. But of course, for most people, it doesn't seem realistic because they haven't looked at the alternatives. So that now, if we bring it back, one of the clients, um, someone that worked at Microsoft as well, high achiever, leader in her space. Literally, when she started with me, she said she, on a level of like how overwhelmed and stressed and not happy she was, she was a one out of 10. And by the time mm. we were done three months later, she was like a, about 7.5, saying she couldn't wait to wake up every day mm. because she felt not only just more happy, more full of life, but she knew that any challenge that comes her way could be overcome because she now had choice of how she responds to every situation. And I, the words I use there is have choice because in the past she didn't think she had choice. She felt that life happens to her, right? So what her manager said, what her team, what her coworkers, what her clients, that's just something that happened to her. Like, you know, if the police pulled you over, that's what happens to you. Mm. And while we were able to reframe, and this is what I encourage everyone to see if you can look at the situation as things happening for you, not to mm. you. And if it's for you, that means it empowers you to be like, oh, wow, everything is happening for me. That means that there's a, at least a lesson, a gift in everything. Right, that's so happening. if that thing is is not a desirable outcome, I mean, obviously, some sometimes things happen. You get pulled over by the cops. Yeah. That's not a thing that you chose. But the question I hear you asking is, you know, how can I look at this and and figure out it's for me? Well, you know, maybe you know, maybe I'll be more careful when I'm driving, and it's actually a good safe decision for my longevity. You know, and maybe there's maybe there's a lesson for me here. I, and and I know that that can you know I know that that can be challenging. And the reason I gave you that example, Mark, is because that's exactly what she said. Literally, like I think two months into our work, she got pulled over by the cops because she was speeding. <laughs> And she's like, constantly, you won't believe what just happened because she had got pulled over in the past. She had a couple of car accidents and she's like, I always freaked out. I was hiding what happened from everyone because I was so ashamed. I was beating myself up so much, but I got pulled over and I had a big smile on my face. <laughs> and then she went home and did the exercise. The exercise I gave her essentially is I like, take a piece of paper, draw a line down the middle. On the left, write down how you feel this happened to you. On the right, on the right side, write down how it happened for you. And it's like, it's so, it opens up your mind because now you have a choice. What do you put your focus? Do you focus on the negatives and then that's all you're going to see in your life because that's what you're looking at? Or are you going to look at the positives and the lessons and be like, wow, I can actually learn from this and move on to the next step. That's what they call growth mindset. Mm hmm. That's right. Yeah. And, I, and I, I love that you have that that two column exercise. You know, I, I think that so often, you know, I mean, I don't hear you saying this, but there's this idea of sort of toxic positivity. Oh, just look at the bright side. And mm -hmm. what I hear you saying is like, you have to acknowledge the darkness, the pain, the, the discomfort, you know, I, I, I'm not I, I'm not choosing and I don't have choice. Like, I mean, I have some choice, obviously, but if the, you know, if, if, a, if I get caught speeding or something, you know, like there's there's parts of that that are out of my control. And I think, you know, reading, you know, uh, Seneca, Marcus Aurelius, the Stoics, like mm -hmm. coming from that philosophy, the choice that we always have is our response to. A yes, situation. yes. I don't, and you're absolutely right. Because I, I had this, um, my parents, of course, coming from an East European background, communist background. I had a big debate with them around this. It's like, oh, how can you not focus on the negatives? Um, mm -hmm. You know, fear mindset. And I said, it's not that I'm ignoring the negatives, but I choose to put my focus somewhere else because if I only look at the negatives, there's no way for me to see the, the, the good in anything, the positivity and the toxic positivity you talk about, I fell for that many years ago. And then it's kind of like, you know, you put your head in the sand and you ignore the negatives. But now when you ignore them, then again, you can't learn from them. Well, you're not learning from Exactly. Exactly. Right. Yeah. And what came up to share what, as you were talking about the Stoics and whatnot, and with the, with the responses that we have, that's what really your power resides in, because you'll have thoughts and beliefs come up all the time. First, mm -hmm. you got to get aware of them. And once you're aware and you accept the knowledge and all that, you can start to get curious and you can start interrupting them and replacing them. By curiosity, I mean like, oh, is it is this my thought or belief or is it coming from, let's say, my parents when I was growing up? Because, mm -hmm. you know, they grew up mm -hmm. in a different mm -hmm. environment and they pass it down to me. Is it from my society? And the more curious we get, the more answers we receive. 
And then we have the power of choice because you can still look at the, at the list we made, the negatives and the positives, and you can still choose to look at the negatives. But then remind yourself, get curious, what happens when you do that? And when you start doing an exercise about your life and no one else's, you will start to realize the power of this because you will realize that, wait a second, things will start showing up in your life based on where you put your focus on. And there's a ton of research on this as well, right? You can look at like, if I tell you, think of a red card, right? Or you want to buy a red card. When you go on the street, you're going to see mostly red cards because your mind mm -hmm. starts to focus what your attention yeah. is on because you have too much input. It cannot show you everything. Yeah, there's I, for, I, I forget what the what the line is, but you know, where, where you put your attention, that's, you know, that's what that's what grows. Focus so if you're spending yeah. all your time thinking about what went wrong and how terrible it was that that feeling that outcome, you know, sort of, you know, it's like a self fulfilling prophecy. Um, it is. I'm, I'm it looking, is. I'm looking at the clock a little bit. And I wanted to make sure to ask you uh, yes. about these you, you mentioned uh, to me and, and I want to hear more about the live events that that you're planning. Yes. So I did a test event about a few weeks back at the end of uh, March. And I said, you know what, let me see if I can start sharing a lot of what I've learned. And mm. with the idea of just giving back, right? I'd be like, this, these are my ideas. This is what I've seen. Now, when I say my ideas, they're taken, you know, inspired by other people, inspired by people, yeah, inspired we by... We don't you know. live in a vacuum, of course. Exactly, yeah. right? <laughs> but it's like, hey, this is how I think about stuff. And it was received very well. I had good attendance. People were really excited. Some people were like, wow, I want to work with you because I see how you think. I'm like, let's start doing more of this. So about once a month, once every two months, I do either a four-hour masterclass where we dive deep into those three pillars I mentioned, which is the psychological foundation, the why in your vision, and the gifts and strengths, right? Those are kind of the big pillars. And of course, the idea is about achieving more, stressing less, and creating time for what you love. That's the promise. You come in as someone that maybe is a bit too busy, maybe overwhelmed, and at the end, you'll see the system that other high achievers like myself, my clients, and others are using to essentially literally create time mm. for what they love. Yeah. And the four-hour masterclass will dive into this. There's also five-day challenges I'm putting together as well, which will be essentially two hours per day for five days, where it's all you know. There's homework at the end of each day. There's exercises, which some you'll get in the four-hour masterclass, but it will give us even more time to go deeper, right? Because yeah. the idea yeah. again is not to come to yet another event to fill your calendar. Is to come to an event where hopefully you find inspiration and empowerment to guide you on this journey. Yeah, I like. I just. Just the idea. I mean, for me, if you tell me that I can work with you and I can create time, I'm so I'm sold. <laughs> You know, I, I do, a, I do a really good job, I think of, you know, balancing my life and I, you know, I make sure I spend time with my kids every day and I see my wife and I, I get some self-care. I go to jujitsu every day. That's my self-care time. Mm -hmm. um, and I'm always on the lookout for how to do, you know, this is from you know, that book, Essentialism, like, how can I do less, but better? You know, how can I be, you know, how can I have, a, a, how can I serve more people? How can I have a deeper impact? And I love that you're doing these events, because that's what I'm hearing you, you do, like, you're, you're taking yeah. everything that you've learned in your life, but also with all of this professional work you've done with these clients and all the learnings that you've done. And you're saying, let me put this in a format that really anybody can benefit from. A hundred percent. And that's, that's, I love what you said there, because for me, what I've come to realize in this life is that what my why is or my purpose is, is about inspiring and empowering others on this journey so they too can find fulfillment joy success and get to shine their light in the world because the way i say it now is mm. and there's a beautiful quote i i like by gandhi uh, that says something to the lines of be the change you want to see in the world and what came up for me is that i made my own quote out of it is like be the light you want to see in the world because there's a lot of darkness. We can agree on that, right? We can focus on the darkness and, you know, think that the world is going to end and all that stuff. And there's a lot of proof for it. Now we flip it and we look at the, the light and the love that's out there because we can also create more of that. And if you look at your life, when do you feel best? When you are filled with darkness and hate and fear or when you're filled with love and light? And to me, it was a no-brainer when I figured that out. And I'm like, well, I want more of this and less of this. Uh, that is such a a beautiful uh, place to, to close. Actually, it reminds me of, there's a, <laughs> speaking for throwing quotes around now. Yeah. Uh, there's the quote by Rumi that I love. If everything around seems dark, look again, you may be the light. Yes, I love that. Yeah. I, I and love, I, and oh, I, that's, that's what I hear you. That's what I'm hearing in, in the work that you do is that you're, you're, you're connecting people with that inner light, giving them the, the motivation, the tools and inspiration to, to actually open up and shine that light uh, in the world. There is so much more that I feel like we have to talk about, but I do have to, to close things out we're I'm, I'm gonna have glad. to have you back on the show so we can continue the conversation Likely. um but before we close um where can people find out more about these these live events these master classes you know and and, and how to work with you 
Yeah, absolutely. I mean, you can, best way to find me is on LinkedIn right now as I build a website and everything else, or rebuild it, I should say, Constantin Bo Moron. And Constantin is without an E at the end. I have the Eastern. I'll put the link in the show notes. So if anybody's listening, you can, wherever you're listening to the podcast or watching on YouTube, you could, there's, there will be a link yes. below. Yeah. And the podcast itself, Unleash Thyself, you can find it anywhere you find podcasts. And of course, YouTube as well. And I'm a, I'm active across all social media platforms. And Mark and I collaborate on reels and stuff. So you'll see us. Uh, yeah, you'll def- you'll there. definitely see some social posts from this. Maybe we can maybe we can do a whole episode on on creating reels. Right. Well, look, it's been so awesome to have you again. I I feel like we have so much more to talk about, but let's close things here and let's make sure that we talk again. Thank you so much for coming Thank and sharing you, your wisdom, sharing your light. Thank you, everyone. Thank you for listening to that episode. I had a great time talking to Constantine and there's so much in there. I encourage you, please check out the links in the show notes. He's got some great events coming up. He's got a great program that he runs. He's, he's giving a lot of this stuff away because he just, he loves to serve people. And I get that. I love it. I love to serve people and this podcast is one way. So if you like the podcast and you'd like to support me and continuing the podcast, do all the things like it and comment, leave me a message. Please share the podcast with your friends. And I look forward to seeing you next time on the art of transformation. 